Well, uh, good evening and uh, a very warm welcome on this uh, June evening to tonight's Talk to Thinking, which uh, we'll be asking, should Boris Johnson declare a national education emergency? Uh, we were um, uh, piped in there by the School of Rock over some uh, actually fairly uh, serious slides about the situation as it is now. Uh, I'm Matt Dancona and I'm an, one of the editors at Tortoise and if the question uh, we're, we're addressing tonight sounds a little bit melodramatic and urgent, well um, that's by design because what we're really asking this evening is whether 15 months to the day since uh, the Prime Minister declared the first national lockdown on March the 23rd 2020, uh, the time has finally come to ditch the usual bromides and warm words and uh, promises of incremental remedial work and to confront honestly the full urgency of the educational backlog that's faced by pupils and students in this country. And I guess the risk too, if the Prime Minister doesn't unambiguously launch a meaningful strategy uh, to do something about this, uh, that we'll end up with what is a, in effect a lost cohort of kids who will be paying the price in various ways for the rest of their lives. So as ever, the purpose of our thinkings on Open Newsroom is to hear from you. So do let us know uh, what you're thinking in the chat, which we'll be uh, keeping a close eye on and which is being ably steered this evening by my colleague, Seb Jones. Evening, Seb. Um, and we have two terrific speakers to help us make sense of the moment. Kike Agumbiade, who is head of the Commission for the Future and Purpose of Education and National Program Director for Researchers in Schools at the University Access Charity, The Brilliant Club and much else besides. And Lord Jim Knight, who was a cabinet minister under Gordon Brown and is now Chief Education Advisor at TES Global. Having founded the TES Institute in 2014, he has a wealth of experience in teacher qualification and many other areas. And we couldn't ask for two better people to, to really um, get us going on this subject. So uh, conscious of time, I'd really just like to dive straight in and, and ask you, Kiki, how, how severe is the problem? We saw those slides and some fairly alarming statistics ranging from um, digital access to mental health. Um, and, and how, in, in the short term, do you think, and in, in, next, in the next, say, six months for a start, should the government uh, address these problems and what should it be really focusing upon? So I think that the scale of the emergency is, is great. Um, I think that it's a complicated emergency um, and one that requires a level of um, broad commitment from across a range of different government agencies to really address it. Um, I think that there's a need to look at the short term um, and I think it's really important to recognise the lost learning but I think it's also and what I've heard from um, lots of parents and young people that I've been talking to um, in focus groups I've been running recently is that there's a much broader range of things that they've missed out on in terms of social skills and experiences, things like Duke of Edinburgh award trips, um, that they feel will make a real difference to their long-term life chances. And we need to look at how we can address those sorts of, uh, those sorts of things in the short term. Um, but I also think that now is the moment to think about some of the things that take a long time to change. Um, things like teacher recruitment and retention, uh, things like the way that our exam system works and how curriculum planning is done. Those aren't things that can be changed overnight, but if we put them off uh, further into the future, we won't make the changes that need to be made in time for, for any of these young people. So, so what I'm hearing is that we need a tactical and a strategic response. And, I, I, and also very interesting point about the, the, the aspects of education which are not you know, narrowly academic and cognitive um, and how to catch up on those because actually, you know, nearly a year and a half in the life of a, a seven-year-old or an eight-year-old is an eternity and to lose that is quite a deficit. And I, I what sort of, th th looking at that just for a minute, the, the sort of social formation aspect, what can be done to, to help people catch up so I think that 
getting the balance between the recognition for them to catch up on uh, lost knowledge, but not necessarily doing that in a way that doesn't give them both the time and the, the nature of how they work um, is a really key thing. So the difference between um, whether you can get them to miss out on the, the lost knowledge that they've missed through uh, individual activities versus group activities. Um, I think those little things uh, from a pedagogy perspective make a difference and we need to give teachers the time um, and the space to plan activities in a way that allows them to do all of that sort of catch up across the broad spectrum. Um, and I think we need to trust schools and give schools the space um, to think about how they best respond to the context that they're in. And different schools have had different um, uh, COVID experiences in terms of the amount of time they've had shut. Uh, I think we need to recognise that primary and secondary schools and earlier settings have all had to operate in very different ways. And so I think we need to make sure that there's a level of trust put in the profession to choose the right way to catch up because they know the young people well enough um, as like better than anyone else. So um, obviously um, not an auspicious start to this when um, it was announced that the, uh, as was in one of the slides, that the recovery fund was not to be, had been hoped uh, 15 billion, but 1.4, which prompted the resignation of Sir Kevin Collins as the catch up chief. Um, what, what was your reaction to that? And do you think it, as, was it, a, did, did you feel at that moment that the prospects of recovery were still born or that they can still be uh, given some animation? So I think it, it was a disappointing moment, but I think that uh, hope is not lost. So I think that uh, there were lots of ways to think about what changes we might need to make that will aid the recovery. I think um, a big part of that is about um, trusting uh, the profession, trusting teachers and head teachers um, and giving them as much choice as possible um, as to what they need. Um, I also think that we need to um, really, really ask the question, like, what are we catching up on um, and what's the future we want to build towards? It's not just about getting people to where they would have been if there hadn't have been uh, COVID, I think it's about saying actually where we was wasn't necessarily good enough for a really large number of young people anyway. So we need to be talking about solutions uh, going forward that fix the problems that have been uh, in the system that very much predate COVID. That's right. It's really interesting because I think that one of the things that I sense is that the the system has been revealed to be very inflexible, very geared to standardized testing, very industrialized, and that it needs in this situation, and perhaps to your point, uh, to be more, much more much more flexible, much more able to offer bespoke services to, to children, which it isn't currently configured to do. Um, Jim, we'll come back to Kike in a, in a second, but Jim, can I come to you? And, and I suppose, it seems that the first task that's going to be facing teachers in, in when the new term starts, and we hope that by that stage, most, if not all of the restrictions will have been lifted. Um, the first task that they're going to face amongst many is, is going to be, I suppose, diagnostic, you know, how much each mm -hmm. pupil has su suffered educationally during this period. Um, and is it, is it feasible to carry out that kind of diagnostic um, under, the, under the present arrangements? Uh, do, do teachers and schools have the resource to carry out that kind of analysis? Uh, some do, and you know, I, I totally agree with Kiki, we need to trust professionals. And I, I, unfortunately, I don't think we have a government that does. And that's one of the, the things that we learned from the pandemic is, you know, whilst other parts of government did step up and do things that, you know, the, the challenge in a national emergency, as Estelle Morris said in a wonderful debate and speech on Thursday in, in the Lords, whilst the wonderful education summit was going on at Tortoise, 
Um, you know, this was the moment when you needed every department to really step on, up and be the best it could possibly be. And what the Department for Education did is it just issued hundreds of pieces of guidance. And it, it, it didn't do that. And uh, it didn't trust professionals. And, you know, and the school's minister is looking to deprofessionalize even further in terms of what it want, what he wants to do with initial teacher training. But I don't want to be overly political, but I do want to say we've got a fundamentally broken school system that was fundamentally broken before we went in to the pandemic. But it's been, yeah, the pandemic has shone a light on, on quite how broken it is, the extent to which if you are born into poverty, you will be disproportionately likely to be unhealthy and you'll therefore be disproportionately likely to struggle at school and you'll therefore be disproportionately likely to realize the opportunities that the country offers you and that that's also not geographically um, spread evenly there are some um, areas where that is a particular problem and that you know it is it is really shocking that we have a a school system and a, a design for our system, for our curriculum, for our school structures, et cetera, et cetera, that at its very best only serves two thirds of our young people well, and therefore fails at least a third. And it does so partly because it is obsessed by knowledge. It's obsessed by cognitive development of children and not by the rounded social, emotional, and physical literacy of children alongside the importance, which is obviously valid, of cognitive um, development. And the opportunity now is to, by declaring a national emergency, if, if, if that creates a sort of punctuation mark and a, and a moment, to properly engage people about a reset. And you know, the tragedy of Kevin Collins um, not getting what he wanted is I think the public are up for this. They are up for thinking about how we might think, do things differently and have less standardized testing and more personalization and a more rounded education experience. And you know, Estelle in her speech, the last thing I'd say, Matt, uh, before you, uh, I allow you to come in again, was uh, she just reminded uh, us of what happened after the Second World War. So in the last great moment of national crisis, you know, a great wartime leader then was defeated and a new government came in. And you know, what did they do for children? Um, they introduced uh, they, health measures, you know, free school nursing, free dental checks, free eye checks, free school meals, um, school milk, school orange juice, um, child benefit, free schooling, uh, and, you know, a, a flawed, as it turned out, tripartite schooling system, but big reforms, big vision, you know, council housing was started, all the things that's ab about levelling up that we should be doing now. And unfortunately, I'm afraid across politics, we don't have the bravery and the boldness of vision to create a country where children are growing up safely and in a way that they can really prosper wherever they are in the country and whatever they choose to do in life. And that's the challenge for now. And that's why a, an emergency could be really helpful. No, I mean, here, here, and I, 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 I totally um, hear your point about the, the, the sort of absence of a governing vision, which is a, a terrible shame. I mean, just, just making it a little bit more granular, um, again, looking at the, you know, the problem facing ahead, coming back to school in the autumn, what are the or what might be the kinds of uh, tools in the toolkit i mean are we are we should we be considering a longer school day for a while or should we be recruiting an army of temporary tutors to help with remedial work whether they're retired teachers or people parents with particular skills or uh, what, what what are the tools that will be useful in a very practical way to teachers and kids this september So many schools, you know, will do in September some kind of an initial baseline assessment to see where where children are uh, cognitively, and there is some benefit in that. I think there's real dangers in in even talking about catch up and the stresses that that creates. 
And I certainly don't think we should talk about a lost generation. I think this, this COVID generation will go on to be great leaders, great teachers, great journalists, etc. cetera, um, uh, despite all of this. But there is a danger for a particular demographic that if we don't, alongside using some of those cognitive baseline assessment tools, also use some other tools around well-being and mental health in particular. You know, the mental health crisis in one of your slides is, is profound. And that is a much bigger blockage to learning than the absence of, of formal learning that we had uh, during uh, lockdown. And unlocking uh, children so that they are receptive to learning will be one of the challenges. And, you know, the School Nursing Association would say, well, why don't we spend some money on a load of school nurses before we spend money on tutors? Um, because they can really help as healthcare professionals located in schools to help with some of that wider assessment. Because frankly, our teacher training, unless you're quite an old teacher, probably doesn't equip you to be a mental health triage nurse. It doesn't equip you to do a lot of those other wider things that we urgently need available to uh, schools as you know, the only universal service for children. It's, it, it's absolutely fascinating. Kika, Kika can I come back to you and, and ask, um, looking back over the last um, 15 months, what do you think the lessons have been on uh, digital learning? Because on the one hand, I suppose we've, we've, we've learned that, you know, it has extraordinary power if used in a, in a socially just way, but we've also seen, you know, quite starkly the the digital divide given an educational face uh, and i wonder how in your in your sort of journey through the last period what what you discovered about that so i think that's a really good question i think you're right to pinpoint the digital divide um i think it's less of a divide and more of a spectrum and i think that that's worth recognizing there are um a whole host of families where like access to technology and remote learning isn't a hasn't been an issue and actually there's been some young people who have been more able to participate in learning because uh, they're not in, they don't have the pressure of being in a classroom and actually they can all contribute simultaneously um, and so they've perhaps had the um, the space and the time to reflect and give their answers uh, through a chat function in a way that they might not in class. So we have to recognise that for some pe young people, there's been a real benefit. Um, I think, though, um, that we need to recognise there's been lots of young people and lots of families where so much stress has been caused as a result of not having devices and feeling an extra level of exclusion, um, both socially and from learning. Um, I think the other area where digital has been quite interesting is parental engagement. And so um, I think one of the things that I've heard from lots of teachers and from parents is that for those parents who have the technology, but perhaps have struggled with the time to get into school and found the physical school building, a place that's very intimidating, schools have been able to connect with those parents um, and bring them in and engage them in, in their child's learning in a way that's been difficult before. So I think there is a real um, set of benefits, um, things that some schools are calling COVID keeps uh, in terms of like online parents evenings um, that mean that parents that are working three jobs can actually still have a conversation with their child's teacher. But there is a whole host of people who have been really, really excluded. Um, and we need to recognise uh, those challenges and think about how we respond to those. And, and do you think, do you think, have you change your opinion on the the quality of digital or rather the, the, the there had been a trend i think before the pandemic to believe that there was going to be an inexorable rise in digital learning and that this was simply an alternative way of doing what we we had done hitherto in real life i think there is there has been a certain backlash against this in a sense that actually you know in-person teaching is is better than perhaps we've given it credit for? I definitely think my experiences from talking to the teachers that I work with on our research and schools programme um, is that 
in-person teaching is essential. Um, and I think that that comes from a, a range of different aspects. So um, part of that is about the um, kind of the fairness between different peoples. It's much easier to see the level of engagement happening with young people if you're in a room with them um, than it is when they're all on screens and you can't necessarily see what they're doing. Um, and yes, there are schools where and classrooms where that's been able to be gotten over relatively well, but it's still quite hard. Um, and so, um, but there are things that are easier to do online when every kid has um, uh, their own access. So whether that's um, using ways of explaining things with animations that is actually sometimes quite hard to do in a classroom that you can do more easily via a computer. So I think we have to recognize that it's, it's a nuanced picture. Um, I think that COVID has meant that there are things that we've really had to um, think again about. So I think teacher CPD um, is one of those areas where um, having a national conference where you get to connect specialists in particular subjects up across the country um, doesn't need to cost what it costs to do it in person and doesn't lose very much from being online. Um, but actually like the relationships between teachers and young people in classrooms, the trust that is um, built up between teachers and, uh, and, the, teach and the pupils that they teach, um, that just can't necessarily be replicated in an online setting. Um, I think the other aspect of this is safeguarding. Um, and I think uh, that a lot of what we've um, lost um, through uh, online teaching is that um, uh, teachers are one of the kind of main places where we flag uh, issues with young people. Um, and for so many young people, um, things have not been raised and the relationships with social services um, have meant that lots of people, young people have gone under the radar when yeah. people need to be stepping in um, and, and making a difference to, to quite traumatic circumstances. No, absolutely. Uh, Jim, um, if I can come back to you, um, what, have, what lessons have you learned about inequality during the pandemic and, and what we should do about it? And, you know, we've talked a little bit about levelling up. Um, you know, do you think it actually has any content yet? And if not, what should what content should it have moving forward? Uh, I don't think it has very much content at all. It, it's got a, some bits of money flying around, um, but I don't have a strong sense of a strategy. Yeah, currently, the, the government's got a skills and FE bill that's that's going through parliament starting in the lords and that's an attempt to do some things around extending some of the higher education finance into adult skills more widely and uh, and a focus on adult skills is really welcome in terms of delivering some of the leveling up that's needed and and that that legislation will allow essentially local employer partners to sort of set the agenda in terms of what adult skills are being developed and and that that might work i think there are all sorts of flaws with with the bill but you know if anywhere you look around the world adult skills it has to be one of the top priorities for any government just because of the accelerated rate of de-skilling that is going on in the labor market you know even by algorithm um, when we look in, in areas like logistics, um, where it's just become a competition between labor and capital as to who's going to be cheapest. Uh, and, you know, there's a whole swathe of logistics workers will be out of a job in a minute um, if, if they don't repress their, their wages. In, at a school level, yeah, I, you know, it's, it's just about tutoring because, again, we're just obsessed about, you know, if we can help people catch up their lost learning so that they can then do well enough in their tests then they'll get their qualifications and then they'll be able to get on and you know we'll be back on the the sort of core algorithm that that our whole education system is is built on um frankly i think it's all uh, uh from a bygone era and uh we now need to think you know we think about social mobility and education as going together as being something that benefits individuals who get those qualifications and go to university and don't look back. 
and and there's some truth in that for individuals but if we're serious about leveling up then we've got to be serious about every child in every part of the country believing that they can be prime minister so it's not whether or not you go to eat whether you can be prime minister it's whether or not you are from a community and people from a community like yours and who have the same skin color as you and, and are like you can do whatever they want to do you know and that's a different that's a development of a mindset that we just don't have currently in our school system and 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 that would allow for community level social mobility and that's what leveling up should be about and we're just a long way short of having a, a proper strategy for that no it's absolutely 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 right um thanks you we'll, we'll come back to you in a second uh, can i go to sean woodhead if if she's about um sean yeah hi hi how are you i'm good thanks um i was uh, very interested in the point you made in the chat about cams um following on from uh, the point jim made about mental health and so on um can could you i don't want to paraphrase so could you could you elaborate a bit on that because it seems to me that you raised a, a, an extremely important point about how we address the mental health crisis. Um, yeah, I feel like I come on thinking a lot and talk about CAMS, so apologies right, so if anyone's talk, heard me before. Talk about um, it till we sort it. It's, um, we have, in my area, anyway, I'm a social worker, so I work closely with schools, obviously, um, including CAMS link workers, but they're still overworked, understaffed, so the the thresholds have changed massively, I feel, in recent years. So basically now, as far as my experience is, for a child or young person to actually get mental health support, they literally need to be on the brink of seriously harming themselves or having already harmed themselves. Otherwise, it's kind of down to a school counsellor that the school will have bought in or down to people like myself, like one of... The families I'm working with, um, the dad is currently telling the CAM service, the social worker is doing your job for you. My daughter is telling her that she is suicidal. She's not a mental health professional. Um, and that's the same for people who work in schools. I think there's too much pressure um, put on people who, like Jim said, don't have that training. Um, and I think it's really important for the future of our young people that there's a more consistent and accessible support with mental health available for everybody. No, it's really, it's really interesting. And, and, and you know, the, you said that you always talk about CAMS and all power to your elbow, because I think that and it, this is just something that is going to have to be said and said and said again until the problem is recognised, because um, it, it simply isn't at the moment. And the, the notion that there's parity between the mental health system and the... Uh, the other parts of the NHS is 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 is, is ridiculous. Um, I wonder if we could come to Louise Simpson, uh, who was making some interesting points in the chat. Hi, Louise. How are you? I'm very well. How are you? Uh, good. Um, I, 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 I again, you you had a very interesting um, sort of reverting to the the emergency notion. You had a very interesting suggestion about schools staying open during the holidays. I wondered if you wanted to talk about that a little. Well, if it is such an emergency, what a brilliant opportunity to just, ca you've, you've got no summer, because they've got no summer. So why not use this basically blank two months? It would, it would help people, people working. It would, it would help reintegrate them into school. I completely agree that the whole system needs an overhaul, but I mean, in the short term, just to send the message loud and clear to everyone in the country that something's actually being done, keep the schools open. And just and just pay that you know the government will have to cough up the money um, to pay everybody to do that. But I, I mean, I, it it just sounds like it just that just seems a simple solution. And would you would you um, envisage the act the activities going on in the schools to be, you know, traditional cognitive knowledge based lessons or a, a slightly more loose limbed? Um, it could be a, be a real hotchpotch, a really interesting yeah. melting. As, um, you know, I mean, there are schools that, you know, run, run um, sort of drama clubs and sports clubs during the summer. I mean, those could be sort of just massively made larger and more comprehensive. And it could just be like a real 
you know, get together moment. So it's like a celebration of being back at school. Um, you've got the time, you're not going on holiday. Make that a life experience that they, that these kids will remember, maybe not the older ones, but the younger ones will. But no, make, no. make it feel like a holiday because learning shouldn't, shouldn't be a sort of burden anyway. If it's made interesting, it could be an adventure for them. If it's, if it's pitched to children as an adventure. Jim, Jim asks in the chat, Louise, who would staff these uh, schools, which is, a, I suppose, a, a, a good question, although perhaps one for the DfE to answer rather than you. Um, I, I wonder, sorry, go on. Definitely not me, but I mean, maybe people, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, when my daughter was young, I was brought in to, to, to talk about the, the subjects I knew about. And I mean, you could just extend that. So, you know, historians go in and talk about history um you know i'd done an archaeology degree so I, I went in to talk about egypt but drama actors plays make it a huge a kind of festival of school no absolutely um can i come to daniel dipper who um i imagine is broadcasting live from oxford or are you at home daniel yeah i'm still at oxford i literally am on my last week i've got two exams left before i finish my first year so nearly done right well, we wish you well with that. Um, you, I think, had some thoughts on this and wondered what, 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 you, what was on your mind about the, the prospects for education policy. Yeah, so I mean, kind of, if this is a simple answer, should we declare emergency? I'm definitely on the side of we definitely should. And I think I'd echo a lot of what Louise has just said, really. I think that, you know, learning, it's a whole package. It's not just about actually the academic side of things. Um, I don't really see catch up, the idea of that. I don't see that about getting people to the exact same stage they would have been in their maths in, in year nine or whatever. They would need to ensure that they do have a basic knowledge of that to equip them for later life. But I think exactly what Louise was saying, it's about these extracurricular activities and really, as, as Louise was saying as well, connecting to the community. Um, so I definitely, well, I'm very disappointed that the funding wasn't allocated. I definitely think it should be. I think education needs to become a, a higher priority um, because, you know, this is the future of our country. And actually, I see that putting money into education, we should see it as an investment in future skills and jobs and growth for the nation. Um, and yeah, that's that's why I think that education is so, so important and why I think it's disappointing. It hasn't been given the focus that I think it really needs and deserves. Do you think we're missing out um, undergraduates in this analysis, Daniel? I mean, uh, because obviously it's been a very trying time for, for them too. Um, will they need, will you need, you know, you and your friends need, um, you know, assistance in, in, in the winter term? Or do you feel that things are, are reverting in an incremental way back to something like normal? Um, yeah, I think that's a really good question. I should say, I suppose, in flag, I am at Oxford. Um, and I do think that my experience has been slightly different because of that. Um, because of the very small group teaching. So I think that that is something to flag to say that my answer is not representative of all undergraduate students and what provision they've been provided. Because in regards to how much teaching I've had, I've had the same, if not slightly more, than I would have had pre-pandemic. Because there's been some extra revision classes this term for the exams that we're doing at the moment, which we just need to pass to progress to the next stage of the degree. Um, and we have some extra classes on them to ensure that we're basically as, as well prepared as possible. So in regards to kind of my education, I mean, I suffered with COVID for, for quite a few months. So I think that in some respects, I'm a little bit behind, but I think at the same time, actually, I'm still generally on track with my degree and I think I'll be okay. I definitely think though there should be more provision classes in place and extra provision um, in regards to particularly, I mean, structure of essays is particularly important to my degree. Um, so I think for undergraduates, I think that it depends university by university, but I definitely think that there should be focus on those already at uni, but I'd actually say I would be placing more resources to those who are coming up now, um, because, you know, coming, my education stopped in kind of March, and then I started university September, whereas these students have had a year and a half of their education being disrupted. So I definitely, if I was a university, be thinking, okay, the current undergraduates need some support, but actually those that are coming in now need a particular focus. Well, we're, we're, we're glad to see you, uh recovered from covid daniel and uh sorry you had it and and glad that the that things have, have have got back to you know a a, a, 
a, a decent a decent level. Can I go to um, Luke, my colleague Luke Wadema, who is um, one of the office's um, great polymaths, and I always discover something new about Luke every day. And one of them is I just found out he's an archaeology graduate. This I didn't know that. Is there no limit to you and your expertise? <laughs> um, so having having observed that, um, you, you've made about 19 really interesting points in the chat, and I'm not proposing to ask you to summarize all of them, but there were, were several, I mean, uh, one or two were particularly interesting. One was your, you were talking about class sizes, which I think is very interesting, and also about uh, addressing charitable status. So anyway, give, give us a Luke's eye view of, of, of what we're discussing. Well, it's, thanks, Matt. Um, it's tricky to, to answer a question like, uh, what, what would a reimagining of education look like? But there are people in this country who are seriously trying and have been for a long time and actually started doing so long before we, we had the challenge of, of COVID. Um, so one of the things I put at the top of that list was about charitable status. I think this has been a, a real sticking point for a long time for people who desire education reform because they think it will make a bigger difference than in fact it would. But it's a, it's a starting point for trying to do well, the way I was putting it was bring the, the ceiling and the floor closer together because that's the, the real problem we have in this country is the, the, um, the divergence in, in educational outcome between kids who, who go to state schools and those who go to private schools. And a lot of that is driven by underlying uh, conditions at home, but, uh, but for the most part, it's driven by the fact that state schools, you have larger class sizes, um, lower levels of extracurricular activity, um, and also uh, uh, tend to come from households that can't afford to pay for exam preparation preparation materials. And that's a huge thing that I, I had it in my list. Uh, that I think really needs to be tackled is the extent to which we democratize the currently really concentrated market for exam prep. Kids in this country go through a bunch of really important, um, I, I use the word eliminative exams, exams that eliminate you from a process if you do badly. Yeah. Um, and a, a lot of those exams are pay to play, um, pay for preparation materials from a private business, pay for uh, supplementary tutoring. And I, I made a point about the national tutoring program, which obviously has exploded in, in the past year when the government started taking it seriously, but it predates the pandemic. And it shows that there's a huge amount of teaching expertise and teaching capacity in this country that's not deployed in schools. It's just deployed in a secondary market that's unregulated and um, where the best services go to the highest bidder. And that's, um, that's another major problem. So I mean, I can, I could go on, but I think to the to the title of this thinking, declaring a national emergency in terms of education is is long overdue, if that's how you want to put it. And we we shouldn't be caught up with this idea of catching up from the pandemic. We should be caught up in the idea of reconciling what Jim correctly uh, pointed out at the beginning, which is that we've had a badly defunct education system in this country for a long time. Thanks very much, Luke. Uh, um, I wonder if we might go to. Uh, Jake Maxwell Watts, um, if you're there, Jake. Uh, yes, I am. Uh, just on audio only. Okay. okay, fine. Um, uh, good, good, good. To hear from you, um, Jake. In in the chat, you 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 rather wonderfully opened up the horizons of the discussion by, you know, just sort of offering a a, a vision of what of what post COVID education might be and. I noticed the response to it was was very positive. Could, can you can you kind of talk us through that because it was it was rather inspiring? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, I, I guess I'm talking from the perspective of a millennial um, and thinking about the sort of opportunities that my generation faces, aware acutely of education being more expensive to us than it was in previous generations, housing being more expensive. Um, and the workplace being a much more competitive place. I mean, maybe that's just my perspective, but um, I know there are various challenges faced by this generation that I feel could require a bit more joined up thinking. And the debate could be about how we change the curriculum within schools or what we do in the education system. But I think it might be more productive to think of the education system as being part of, uh, excuse me, part of the life cycle of a child, if you like. It's uh, part of 
health. It's part of um, preparing us for, for a longer term future. And I was wondering if we were to think about education in the context of housing, in the context of what we do during summer breaks, in the context of mental health and of community engagement and in job prospects and apprenticeships long term, what would that look like? And it's really just a sort of philosophical question. I don't have any answers to that. No, but it's a very, it's very, uh, it's, a, it's the right question. And obviously, the, the part of the problem in all of this is that, you know, we've already heard in terms of the, the emphasis upon mental health, that the, the right questions aren't being asked, I think, uh, by policymakers. Um, can, can we uh, go now to uh, Helena Sorfaniec, um, who's one of our regular attendees at Thinkins? Indeed, it doesn't seem right to have a thinking without you, Helena. Um, <laughs> tell us what. Tell us what I to take that as a compliment or not, Matt. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a well, the highest compliment, you know, the sine qua non. Um, tell us what you're thinking about the question tonight. Yeah, I really wanted to pick up on what Jim said earlier about um, how we don't really have a long term approach to learning. And, and I would like to focus more on the adult learning side of this. I think often when we talk about the notion of catch up, we focus specifically on schools. Um, and I think Daniel pointed out a really interesting point when he said that at Oxford, his learning has continued Obviously, a lot of it has gone online, but relatively unchanged. And a lot of that is to do with the fact that uni higher universities um, like Oxbridge or others in the Russell Group do tend to have smaller class sizes. And, and when you look at universities like that and you almost take a sort of big schools approach to them, if you will, you see how even between universities, the provision of services has vastly differed during COVID. Um, and it's not fair to kind of generalise university students as having had this singular experience when actually there are certain universities where students have lost out more than others. Um, and I think especially now when we look at graduates and the plights that they're facing, I know that's something Daniel mentioned too, but this situation is only going to continue to get worse. The job market is only going to get more saturated and more saturated as more people graduate and there are fewer jobs available. And I think taking a, a much longer term approach to learning, looking at adult learning and looking at skills and retraining is so, so essential. And it should be considered as part of education rather than something you know, post-education or, or to do with employment, those two things should be considered as intertwined because ultimately well-being and success in education is critical to well-being and success economically. So it's interesting because ever since I've been uh, writing about education, which is goes takes me back to the 90s, I'm horrified to admit, um, ministers have talked about lifelong learning and skills revolutions, and it's never meant anything. So, but what I'm, what I hear from what you say, Helena, that we've moved now into a situation where it's that these things aren't, aren't, aren't just options, they are essential. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. We perhaps need different nomenclature, I think, so that people don't just ignore them because they, they, they are, I mean, particularly the, 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 the whole issue of skills tends to be eyes glaze over, but actually could scarcely be more important, particularly as tomorrow's uh, you know, pupils are going to be probably performing three, four, five careers in the in the time of an extended life. Uh, um, I, I wonder if uh, my colleague Chris Cook is about for. Um... Hello, Chris. There he is. Um, Chris, about uh, than whom no one uh, in journalism knows more about education than. Um, I mean, uh, you're <laughs> you were the you were the maestro behind it, the education summit last last week, and you know you, you you're on you've been on top of this for m for many years. I mean, what do you, you may be able to hear cooking going on in the background. Yes, well, I mean, you know, that's you're a multitasker. Um, tell us what your broad. I mean, looking back over the pandemic period, you know, during which you've done quite a bit on education as as, as ever. What is your view of the way forward i mean it's a, it's a very broad question but i'm keen to get your sort of headline headline thoughts so i think i think the uh in broad terms i think we should worry less about kids being behind where they normally would be than we than we people have tended to i think we should worry more about littler children in particular and their socialization we should be um 
petrified about what the exam system is going to look like in about a month and a half's time um when the you know these um uh teachers have basically been put absolutely to the mill to to generate a set of exam results that everyone knows are going to be disregarded um we've completely wasted huge amounts of of potential educational time um to deal with um to get a a grade so that we can sort of pretend that things haven't been as traumatic as they have been over the last year um we really should have just accepted we couldn't grade accurately this year and and worked from that starting place um i think that the the we should worry less about um we should worry more about sort of fulfillment and socialization of little children in particular is our first priority um everyone has had a rotten year but no one has had a more rotten year than small kids who are still learning how to be people um, yep. been stuck inside all year um i think that's the that's where i would be putting my my focus at the moment i think the I also think I, I, the person who produced the estimates about the learning loss, the, the earnings loss in future and the GDP losses in future from education is a, a brilliant and esteemed economist. And, but I'm slightly skeptical about the idea that um, we can extrapolate from normal losses of learning into a society wide loss of learning to create these gigantic figures. I mean, fundamentally, every 18 year old in the country this year is going to have to learn a bit of stuff to get up to where they normally would be at a workplace and the you kind of can't extrapolate from what happens when you have one person missing skills um to what happens when everyone ha misses their skills because the incentives for employers are going to be very different to normal as well so that's my sort of i don't know if that was that's quite a scattergun no it's very it's very helpful i i mean the follow-up question is i remember uh before the pandemic you, you you said something to me which really stuck with me which was that the the kenneth baker's 88 education reform act was after the founding of the nhs the sort of most enduring um piece of public policy legislation that this country had seen post-war so yeah. I, my question to you is has that has the 88 act now hit the buffers is it time for a a new um structure to be put in place in 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 a fairly grand and and theatrical fashion like the 88 act so i think i think um i think you have to take so it's ken ken baker and actually sort of to be fair like shirley williams and mm -hmm. and um uh keith joseph and people before them who sort of did the work leading up to to ken baker um they put in place this structure which so we had gcse's so for the first time everyone took exams at 16 which was a thing that we've sort of memory hold that most kids didn't in the 90s we started having league tables we started having regular inspections of schools it became no longer possible for kids to go to school not be taught anything and leave without anyone noticing right that is the fundamental achievement of the 90s um and it's it's been a huge success we've had this enormous um uptick in the in the quality of education for the median child for most children um education has got wildly in, incomparably better since the late 80s um the the problem we've got really is that since then we've kind of become like a, a golfer with one club right we keep trying to use the same tool for a very wide variety of problems and so we think well actually the accountability and inspection drove up standards for a long time really effectively but the problem and actually we have quite a good school system for fighting inequality we just have a very unequal society that it sort of rests upon the problem we've got though is from here you can't just keep beating the horse harder and harder and harder and make it, hoping schools will get better and better and better and better what you need to do is come up with a way of making the horse run faster right overall you need to sort of think about whether all you're doing is hurting the horse by increasing all of this accountability without making it go any faster. Um, and I think that's where we've reached, really. I think the, that's, our, that's our fundamental problem. Um, you can't just examine and inspect your way to ever higher standards. You actually have to spend more money on teachers. You have to spend more money on training teachers. You have to go for smaller class sizes. You have to have sort of fat in the system so that difficult, different sorts of, of difficulties can be dealt with more more easily by schools that are needing to have sort of specialist support processes for it. And I think that's sort of roughly where we've got to. We just kind of have to try and have a less lean, more capable school system with more capacity in it. Um, but that's really difficult because that's really expensive.
Like yeah. we've, we've built like a really lean school system that doesn't waste any money um, and does pretty well by poor kids, like compared to our international peers, not well enough, but pretty well. Um, it's just you, this model kind of at the end of its road, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think, to be clear, I don't think you can get rid of, I don't think you can get rid of like the accountability or anything. I think what no, you no, no, I understand. Is, like, is you need to think about bul bulking up the system, spending more on teachers, spending more on training, spending more on that. Sort of, I mean, there's no cheap way through it, basically. No, absolutely. Um, Jim, can I, can I come to you, conscious that time is much gone? Um, a, a to, um, you, you, you post in the chat that you think Ken Baker himself would acknowledge that the uh, the, the, the 88 Act has, has, has hit its sell by date and B, if there were points you wanted to come back on uh, that have been made during the discussion. Oh, there's so much. Uh, uh, so I've been busy typing to it <laughs> because I couldn't, uh, I couldn't possibly remember everything I wanted to say. I mean, Ken, who's a colleague in the Lords, you know, he said clearly that he thinks the national curriculum now should finish at 14 and we should by implication therefore we get rid of GCSE exams at 16 which are the, a kind of redundant punctuation mark that costs a lot of money and costs a lot of time um yeah you know, one of the very few things that endure from my time as schools minister is that we changed the participation age the education leaving age to 18 from 16 and now we've done that we don't need exams at 16 and and, and Ken agrees with that and Ken with his um his UTCs, his uh, University Technology Colleges, which he talks about um, at any available opportunity, um, is him basically saying we have we've got it wrong in terms of the balance of our system. You know, we have something called the EBAC, which basically is an accountability measure just around certain academic subjects for for secondary, and it just excludes the application of knowledge which is you know, fundamentally important for, for so many people and, and you know, also to engage so many people. And that doesn't mean that we sort people uh, between academic and vocational because part of the UTC vision is that you can still go on to university. And, and I think that's right. You know, we talk about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and maths, and, and really that's just S and M. You know, there's not really that much technology or engineering going on in schools um and chris smirks at uh, snm uh, quite rightly because uh and that's Can't deliberate. anywhere Can't take it anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um on on digital i would say that quite understandably most teachers because they've not been trained in how to use technology for teaching just tried to replicate the pedagogy of face-to-face -face, uh teaching and learning online and that's never going to be as good as face-to-face -face teaching. But there is uh, a whole raft of work, people like Diana Lorillard's uh, research, about how you can develop pedagogy for teaching online and, and doing things that are inconceivable in the classroom. And, you know, and the blend between face-to-face -face and online is probably better than either face-to-face or online, 100% online is, is inevitably going to be worse than face to face, but, but blended is better. And you know, we need to properly allow that to happen. And, and the final thing I'd say is, you know, I've, I've been working with a, in, in the adult skills area with a, a, a proposition, you know, we're opening a school in, in London later this year, where there's no prior attainment required. You, you apply by playing a game for three to four hours on a browser. And that tests your cognitive potential. You could be illiterate and you can still uh, be uh, accepted. You then have a month in a sort of sink or swim experience where you're, you're learning to be a software engineer and you're learning from each other. You, there's no teachers. It's, a, it's a, a, a way of learning where if you don't know the answer, you ask the person on your left. And if they, they don't know, you ask the person on your right. And if they don't know, you ask Google. And at the end of, of two years of free tuition, you're a full stack software engineer. And this is a proven pedagogy in something called Ecole 42 School 42 in Paris, where the average starting salary was 50,000 euros and the employment rate was very close to 100%. Now, so these new models of skills transfer are emerging that don't need qualifications. And my sense is with qualifications are the lifeblood of our education system. And the value of them is slowly being eroded by 
in, certainly in the labor market by employers who are looking for better proxies for what your skills are rather than a qualification that you took some time ago. I'm sure that's right. Thank, thank you so much, Jim. Um, I'd like to uh, go to Kike, if I may. Um, Kike, uh, two, two, two things really. I mean, first, if there was anything like, as with Jim, that you wanted to pick up on, but secondly, um, you know, an impertinent question really, but if you, if you were able to, you know, sit opposite Boris Johnson for half an hour, what would be, you know, what would be your ask? What's your, what's your main, you know, you're a, you're a leader in this field. You have an extraordinary wealth and hinterland of experience. What's the message you want to convey to him about what needs to be done and right quick? Uh, thank you for that. So I think in terms of things to pick up on, I'd really want to pick up on the um, the conversation about early years and the importance of investing um, in in early years at this stage, um, because we know that um, the investment we put in then makes so much more of a difference in terms of closing the gap. Um, and I think thinking about it in terms of poverty, in terms of geography, um, and in terms of the digital divide is really important. Um, if I were able to uh, sit in front of Boris Johnson, um, of all the things I could say, um, <laughs> if I was talking about, about education, um, I think I would say that he needs to listen to the voices of the people who are closest to the system. So young people, um, parents, teachers, um, and employers, and everything that I'm hearing when I speak to those groups is that education should be about creating curiosity and a love of learning and the current system with the accountability measures in it and the exam system um, at the moment is counterintuitive. It's destroying young people's love of learning, love of school, um, and it's stopping them from wanting to acquire more knowledge because it's getting in the way of them um, being happy um, and being excited about learning. Um, so I think that's what I would say to him. And I would say to him that um, there's a real mismatch between uh, uh, what schools are being incentivized to focus on and what employers are saying they really look for in, in young people when they, when they come out at the end of the system. Well, he would be very lucky to hear that. And I hope he would uh, pay attention, though that his attention deficit is not always um, fantastic. Uh, thank you, Kike. Uh, uh, it's been a fantastic discussion. Time is narrowing out, um, and I can't possibly do justice to all the points that have been made and all the notes I've taken. Uh, but let me try and uh, say just a few recaps, just some some of them. Um, one of the things I was struck by actually was the optimism in 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 the debate. Um, it was a real blow. The 1.4 billion and the um, uh, resignation of Kevin Collins, but there was a lot of uh, positivity in the room, and that's great. Uh, and another very striking point was that uh, both Kiki and Jim agreed very quickly that, that the uh, the problems with the system predate COVID, and actually what we've what we've seen during the pandemic is is merely these existing problems being accentuated and, and given greater clarity and focus, but they're not specific to or even necessarily consequential to the, 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 the impact of lockdown and the pathogen. And I think that's an incredibly important sort of message to take away. On digital, uh, I, I was interested in Kike's notion of there being a spectrum rather than a divide, which I'm sure is, is correct. And Jim making the point that we have to acknowledge that digital pedagogy is different to uh, real life teaching and, and, and build that into our assumptions about how to go forward. A very strong emphasis from the off about, uh, about me mental health, both from Jim and Sean, and clearly that is going to be one of the biggest um, uh, issues with it that, that all people involved in education and pastoral work in teaching are going to have to deal with. Um, it, it, it's clear that the resources are not there and they should be. And it, really the costs involved, when you think of the overall price of the, um, of, of the COVID recovery program, the, the, the cost of bringing counselors and, and 
triage nurses, as, as Jim put it, 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 it is really pretty small. Um, I was also very struck by Chris's point that, that the most important element of catch up um, is socialization and, and to remember that, you know, the, the, this is really what the, the very young will have lost in, in the last period and that that is the, as important as cognitive knowledge uh, skills are, that that is really what we need to kind of pay attention to. Um, I, I, think, I think it was interesting how uh, inspiring some of the contributions were at a time when you might expect people to be gloomy, people were coming up with ideas, Louise talking about keeping schools open over the summer, you know, possibly impractical, who knows, but you know, a, a kind of a very, a very strong idea which would do a lot of good. And Jake just offering a kind of holistic view of education, which kind of broke out of the, the corset of, 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 of tests and um, eliminative, to use that word that was used, um, uh, assessments and, and, and looking at using this as an opportunity, uh, not letting a crisis go to waste, to coin a phrase. And I think Luke is absolutely right that it, as we move into that, holistic examination of education moving forward, uh, we cannot escape the, the massive um, uh, fee paying elephant in the room of private education and what to do about it. We've managed to avoid really dealing with it since the 60s, but it, it keeps coming up and I don't think any solution to the problem we've been discussing this evening does not have that question as part of it. Helena is absolutely right too that we're moving into a very different world in which um, upskilling, uh, the skills revolution, and um, lifelong learning should just stop being political slogans and become a reality. How to do that? And then a very interesting discussion about the uh, 88 Education Reform Act with some insights into what its framer, Kenneth Baker, Lord Baker, now thinks about it. And I think that. Um, uh, you know, Kiki is right that, 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 that this is now a moment to, to really focus upon the opportunities that are available to us and to focus upon the inequalities in the system and the divisions and to try and, and see education not just as a, uh, an, industri an industrialised process, but as something that is at the heart of everything we're going to be doing as a nation moving forward. Um, that is all we have time for now regrettably thank you all so much for coming thank you to Jim and Kike for being such fantastic speakers uh, we'll be back tomorrow evening at 6 30 where we'll be uh, talking to the wondrous folk from the prima donnas festivals in our first slow reviews thinking so don't miss that meanwhile uh, thank you all very much for taking the time to join us and have a lovely evening bye for now